looking forward to sharing with you a little bit about our EPIC journey. Uh, and I truly do mean that it's been EPIC, E-P-I-C, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our EPIC program um, at the Center for Interprofessional Education at the University of Toronto that's taken a journey uh, across many parts of the world. So uh, again, a hello to you from Toronto. And uh, this is pretty much what the University of Toronto looks like right now, just as we're into uh, middle to late um, fall. It's quite a, quite a beautiful place and we still have some leaves on our trees. So just to give you a little bit of context for, um, uh, for what we are doing in Toronto, our IPE curriculum spans 11 health science programs and about 4,200 students every year from a pre-entry to practice point of view. And we work very closely with 12 of our fully affiliated hospitals. In fact, our center is embedded in one of the large teaching hospitals um, here in Toronto. And from um, the purpose of today's conversation around how we support professional or education or faculty development, we work with about 500 facilitators annually across our many IPE uh, core activities and elective learning opportunities with students. Um, at the center, we have a number of programs. One is our 10 month collaborative change leadership program. Um, with COVID, it actually did move virtually this September. And one of the unintended positive impacts is that we were able to actually integrate learners from Australia um, and the US. This is a five session intensive program that in the past, 10 years has necessitated people to come to Toronto. So the virtual context has really enabled um, some new opportunities for us. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. We also have our boost program, which is focused on intact clinical teams to help them build their teamwork competencies. And you can find information on these. Um, I, I've put the links on each of the slides and the slides will be available after the presentation. But today, I wanted to just focus my early comments on our EPIC program, Educating Health Professionals in Interprofessional Care. And the purpose of the program is really, it's our foundations program in interprofessional education and team-based care. It's really meant for people who are looking for the opportunity to really learn the competencies and capacities to teach both learners and their colleagues the art and the science of working collaboratively for patient or client-centered care and practice. And one of the unique features of the program is that it actually weaves a number of things together. It's not just about building one's capacity as an educator and a professional. It's really about an opportunity for deep immersion and deep reflection to really understand what drives you as a person, your values, your biases, the assumptions you make. And so we weave all of these things together in this five day program. And so from a facilitation point of view, it really um, offers a space for learners and participants to really um, have moments of what Mesereau calls that disorienting dilemma where one or more of their biases, um, assumptions, values are really challenged by the learning that happens in the room and therefore the, the environment is really set up intentionally and designed by the facilitators for transformative learning. We also pay particular attention to emergent design. And so the belief that the curriculum is in the, learn, in the room. And while we have um, a very robust planning process and planned agenda, a lot of things kind of show up in the moment. And so as facilitators, we're always open to really going to where the learners need to go. And that's one of the things that really sets up the learning from a psychological safety point of view. Um, we really work with participants right at the beginning of the program to do some of the fundamentals around um, group norms. But we also have group norms at each of the tables that are quite mixed and diverse from a number of perspectives. Um, and so really enabling a space where people can be vulnerable, can take risks to really share their experience has been one of the hallmarks of the program. And lastly, the concept of the play within the play. Um, we, we have people really participate, as I said, in an immersive experience. So they're learning what they're going to be going out there to teach or 
facilitate or practice in care. And so there's a constant meta-analysis between faculty and participants on the design choices we're making, why a particular activity is structured in a particular way so that they can take all of those learnings back into their environment. So in terms of the process of learning, um, the five-day program is set up in a modular way and there's uh, quite a number of uh, modules, about nine in total, that range from team development to facilitation to collaborative leadership and evaluation. We also have a number of program threads that get revisited across multiple modules. We do use the Canadian Interprofessional um, Health Collaboratives Competency Framework as we adapt it for different contexts across the world, we do use other competency and capabilities frameworks as well. And other program threads like reflection and power and hierarchy. As I said, the program is immersive and experi experiential. And when people register, they actually register in interprofessional teams with a capstone initiative. And there is the opportunity for social learning and networking outside of quote, the classroom. So some of the milestones for the EPIC program, we're now in our 16th year, although we've taken a pause for COVID. Um, the initial program was really meant for university faculty to prepare them for our IPE curriculum back in 2005. But what we started noticing in about 2008 was increasing numbers from the practice context, as well as our first international participants coming to Toronto. Um, we offered the first uh, customized EPIC program. It's about three days outside of Canada. And we've had 20 different interprofessional faculty contribute and participate in the facilitation of the program. We just underwent our a second external review as a center. And one of the statistics I was really proud of was that we've had 26 different international collaborations on our programming in the last six years. And we now have over 2000 alumni of the EPIC program around the world. So the impact of COVID-19 has been an interesting one. As I said, we paused on the EPIC program for June, 2020. We offer it in Toronto every June for the full week, for a full week. And what we've um, noticed and paid attention to is the need to really support virtual interprofessional teaching and learning. And so we've pulled content from a number of our programs and developed some new content. And out of COVID, we've actually la launched our vital program. Um, again, virtual interprofessional teaching and learning uh, with a number of different local partners, but also with some international collaborators as well. But back to our collaboration with Denmark and one of the very first customized uh, EPIC programs, which happened in 2009. And I know Yet is going to speak to this in more depth in terms of what the program now is. But I just wanted to share some key learnings with you from our journey of working with Yetta and the team in the initial program in 2009. And then we had the good fortune of coming back to Denmark in 2014 um, to see what was happening on the ground. And one was really about understanding context. We spent a lot of the time in our planning meetings. We flew to Denmark and um, insisted, I remember with Yetta, Yetta's like, no, we're fine. And we insisted on spending a half a day before the program started, really making sure that we understood some of the nuances of Danish culture and Danish learning. One of the examples was um, training ourselves as facilitators to not use the word interprofessional collaboration, because that didn't resonate in Denmark. And so something as simple as using interprofessional learning. So really thinking about what would resonate from a context point of view. We, we co-facilitated the program, which was very powerful modeling with Yetta and members of her team who were EPIC alumni. So they'd actually come to Toronto and done the full five day program. Yetta reminded me uh, when we were on our planning call last week for this session that we did a lot of briefing, a lot of huddling, a lot of debriefing and debriefing and debriefing. So there weren't a lot of breaks for the facilitators. And this was really the commitment to paying attention to what was happening in the room, verbally and non-verbally, and how did we need to adapt the curriculum, both in the moment and in the following days. We were very lucky to have translation uh, with us. So there was literally someone sitting next to me and the other faculty to translate the Danish portions of the curriculum so we could keep up with what the learners were um, experiencing and vice versa. They were able to translate anything that might not be understood by the two Canadian facilitators. 
also taking risks. So in Canada, in our program, we, we have patients or clients come and tell their real lived experiences of the healthcare system. And this was something we talked a lot about in the planning. And when we did it in Denmark, it was one of the more powerful, one of the most powerful learning experiences for participants. And lastly, just a comment about the real work of all this is about culture change. And Yetta and her team were very, um, very smart to pick this moment of a faculty development program with a lot of people participating to actually launch their Danish society for interprofessional learning. And we were able to support that while we were there. So as I transition to Yetta, I would just ask you to take a moment of reflection to think about what would be needed for any successful adaptation of any particular faculty or professional development program in your context, as you listen to um, Yetta uh, tell you a little bit about her experience. And then when you see the slides, I've left you with a number of additional resources from our website and otherwise that you can feel free to explore at your leisure along with my contact information. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions needed for clarification? You can sh write them in the chat or you can raise your hand. Okay, so... Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to tell about uh, the uh, collabor collaboration with both uh, Maria uh, and your colleagues in Canada and also Rene from uh, Sweden. It's been a wonderful journey. And you're quite right, uh, Maria, that it uh, started in uh, 2009. Uh, my name is uh, Jede Hosman. I'm head of office at, uh, at the capital region of Denmark uh, at a Center for Human Resources and Education. We are not, a, we are not a, an educational institution, but we have uh, educational activities for all the healthcare professions uh, in the capital region of Denmark, uh, both at the hospitals and at, uh, at our communities. Um, I'm uh, originally uh, educated as a nurse. Uh, I'm also a Master of Arts in Pedagogical Theory. And then I have a Master of Arts in Applied Educational Learning and Management. And it was on purpose that I said all this because a part of the interprofessional is not to use acronyms. So, uh, and I have a lot and people don't understand what that long M-A-A-E-L-M -A -A -E is. So, but to move on to the next one, Johanna, um, as Maria uh, mentioned, um, we're from Denmark uh, and Denmark is a part of Europe. We're just uh, north of Germany, um, uh, east of uh, Britain, south of Norway and uh, west of Sweden. Um, and I take this because uh, sometimes we joke with people think that Denmark is a part of Sweden, um, uh, but we are part of Scandinavia, uh, as you may know. And please take the next, next one, Johanna. Um, it's the start of our journey uh, started with, uh, as uh, you said, Maria, with a strategic and leadership focus. We made actually a guiding coalition. When you read about how you uh, are, it, it's how you are, how you should um, succeed with the big transformation. It's very important to have a guiding coalition. And these people you can see in this uh, picture is our guiding coalition. We were 17 people uh, from manager level to clinical level that uh, went to, uh, to Toronto and Halifax uh, and uh, participated uh, at a conference in Halifax. I think it was uh, uh, the one called Across Borders um, that uh, the UK and Canada organizes. And then we had a study visit at the, the University of Toronto. And I'm sure that that guiding coalition was the reason that we have made it so far as we have now. Um, so uh, uh, and me and another uh, partner, as you said, Maria, took your epic course then in June, this was in May. In June, we took the epic course and you're quite right in the, in the fall of 2009, we had the three day course and the establishment, uh, the beginning of our Danish society. Uh, Danish Society for Interprofessional Learning and Collaboration that has a 10 year uh, jubilee uh, this year. 
And I think the reason that we have uh, succeeded, succeeded is uh, that we have had systematic projects within the clinical settings, both at the hospitals that started this journey, but also uh, further on. Um, we are also educating uh, more than 500 facilitators of interprofessional learning and collaboration. And two of, uh, or the two course leaders of this course now is actually attending this webinar. So if you have any questions also to even more to the content, Annette and Annette will probably have, be happy to, uh, to uh, answer. We have also a collaboration with the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands are a part of the Danish um, Denmark, but uh, have their own sovereign. Uh, and we have, uh, have three courses at the Faroe Island for those uh, working there. Uh, and recently also with Stockholm and Sweden that Rene will uh, tell us a little more about later. Please take the next one, Johanna. Uh, one of our tasks uh, in the uh, Danish Society for Interprofessional uh, Learning and, Com and Collaboration is to, uh, to spread out the, uh, the competences of interprofessionality. And I remember, Maria, one of the, uh, one of the times you went, when Denmark, you asked us, well, do you have a, a framework for, for what you're doing? And we thought, yes, we have a framework. We have the framework. Um, of uh, team teamwork, of patient's voice, of hierarchy, of power, all those things you all already have said, Maria. But we didn't have it written down. Uh, and then we took uh, in our society the obligation to try and write down this uh, interprofessional competences. But we made it as an interactive uh, workshop uh, with uh, participants from all over Denmark who, were, who gave their input to how can uh, these competences look. Um, and one of our aims is that this should drive both education, research, uh, clinical uh, settings, uh, all, all the different sectors should be able to see themselves in this uh, framework. I know that you can't read them, but when you um, uh, get the uh, slides afterwards, uh, you can go into details and they're also on our society's web page so you can see them there. Um, as, um, as Maria said, uh, one of the things when we made the course from, uh, from the Canadian uh, perspective to a Danish one, we had to, to make it into a Danish uh, culture and a Danish context. And you're right that one of the, uh, one of our, was one of our key important things was to look at the language. And another example was in Canada, you call, you call these IPE people for champions. Uh, when you're an IPE, you're a champion. But we could never use the word champion in Denmark. Uh, no, no, that's not, that doesn't go into with our culture. So we had, uh, we made the use, we, we used the word facilitator. To be a facilitator, that sounds uh, more, it's more in the tone of the Danish culture. But another thing was that we would, wouldn't be successful, we think, with a five-day course, as you have, Maria, with work from 8 o'clock in the morning to, two, to 8 o'clock in the evening, and make, also make some, uh, uh, an exam on Friday. That would never work in a Danish context. We think uh, of, uh, of learning also as a, a, a transfer between different kinds of modules. Um, and so we have uh, revised the, uh, the, the, the course into a, a three models uh, where we have a focus on learning before, during, and after. Uh, and please take the next one, Johanna. Uh, this model uh, we have uh, created on the basis of Brinkerhof and Apkin and their research. Uh, and it's a model for enhanced effect of competence development. And with a very big focus on what, what do we have to, be, to do before a course, during a course and after a course. Uh, and in that uh, perspective, uh, all our, our course is, um, is uh, created. Uh, and we, we are very keen that this is an important uh, tool for us in order to get, uh, to get the effect in practice that we are looking for. And take the next one, uh, Johanna. 
So our competence development course is now uh, three modules, each of two days duration. And the course is started up by conducting a leadership seminar for the participants managers, as well as a kickoff for the participants. And that was one of the things we actually learned from doing our course at the Faroe Island. That was that uh, having the leadership engagement and make a, a leadership seminar solely for leaders so, so they can discuss how will they use their participants uh, was a very big, um, was very positive and something that we have now incorporated in our Danish version. And the next one, Johanna. So as Maria said, I think the, the content is the same as still in the EPIC course. Uh, we have also, uh, we have three models of two days uh, each. Uh, and the reason that we have one more day, I think uh, for our instance was that we, we wanted to train facilitation even more. We got the feedback from the start that if we call it a facilitator course, we should also be able to train the facilitation even more. So there's a facilitation training all through uh, the six days. I will not go through each uh, bullet because that will take too long. Uh, but again, uh, you are more than happy to, uh, to contact us also afterwards in, also, in order to get some, uh, some additional on this uh, content. And take the next one, Johanna. And as uh, Maria said, uh, one of the things that uh, you also learned us, Maria, was walk the talk. Uh, so that's what we do. We use different learning methods, e-learning, short presentations, exercises, training, inclusion of the participants' own practice. And, and Maria, you're quite right. The citizens and the relative stories are very important. And we have them uh, all through the modules. Uh, and again, when we had the collab collaboration with the Faroe Islands, we were very, it was very important to us that it is a, a, a patient, a citizen from the Faroe Islands and with their uh, cultural uh, setting that, uh, that is important here. The class is divided into interprofessional table teams. We work between the models uh, and there's also an initiative that uh, the, the um, the, uh, the participants have to choose uh, that should be implemented after the workplace, after the course. So I think it's still very much uh, as it was uh, in Canada in 2009 when I participated there. And I also think that's one of the reasons that it's so sustainable, sustainable across uh, the world now in the uh, in in Canada, in the uh, in northern part of Europe, and now also in Sweden. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons that uh, we still have all those uh, participants to the course. And then I just have the last slide. Uh, and um, with my uh, credentials, so you can, my email, so if you uh, wish to contact us afterwards, you're more than happy to do this. I haven't put in our resources as you did, Maria, because many of our resources are in Danish. Uh, and uh, so I guess that is something of a, a language problem. But thank you, Johanna. Oh, thank you, Jeta. There is one quick question in the chat. How many participants were involved in the course? And we what have to... We have, we have between 25 and 36 participants uh, for each course. And in Canada, we have um, up to 50, both when uh, participants are here, but also um, in the customized versions around the world. And it's just about how many can we actually accommodate um, with the number of facilitators to really have that immersive um, small group feel that's manageable. Uh, and Louis, she has a question about the, the implementation after the course, but maybe we can come back to that after Renée's uh, presentation, mm. where we can talk about the impact. Right now, see you, my picture? Yes, looks good. Looks good, okay. Now I invite you to Stockholm. And I'm René, I'm the lead for the Center for Clinical Interprofessional Learning and Collaboration, where we focus on the faculty development. So it's a competency development for the staff. And here you see Sweden in the northern part of Europe. And in the right picture, the region of Stockholm looks quite small, but you have 
two million of the inhabitants in Sweden are living in this part uh, of uh, 10 million inhabitants. Our journey with IPECP started already in the 90s, but um, only with focus on the students with the interprofessional training wards. And then afterwards, you had many uh, student activities. But the question is, what about the professionals? How are we working? How are we collaborating? How we are learning in daily practice? So um, we even know that it's very important um, all the interprofessional collaboration has the goal to be better for the patient. But how do we include this part even in all, all our training for the staff and for the students? So and four years ago, I had the honor to start this uh, IP center where we focus on the professional development uh, regarding IP ECP. Uh, we started, um, we have many, many initiatives in, in Sweden and we, we, we help this people being better and structure their initiatives that they already have started. We really work with all levels, with individual teams, with the uh, wards, with the primary care, but very important also to, to work with the leadership. And while starting this work, we, we, we saw the obvious need to have facilitators that are actually on site where really IPCP is supposed to, to, to be um, happen in the clinical settings. So you see here some of the uh, parts that we think what a facilitator is supposed to can to, to facilitate team collaboration, the learning in the clinical settings and how to include the, the patient as partners and how to acknowledge all the other competencies that we have in the clinical settings. So our journey started actually by research. And I think there are many things that you can find around the world, but I, uh, the eyes were open for use um, for just um, the Center for IP in Toronto and what uh, our colleagues in Denmark are doing. Uh, special while they focus on staff development, not only for teachers, for students, but also the, the ordinary staff. So I had the honor to participate in a short epic in Switzerland, actually, that were done by our colleagues. I'm even um, German speaking, so this was quite near to me to be part of this course to, to see how this is done. And I was really, really impressed. And at the same time, I had the connection with all of this, um, Jette and Annette and the colleagues in Denmark. And I even with a colleague together, we attended on the course that the Danish colleagues have done. And already during this course, I was very, really convinced this is something that we need to have in Stockholm. So we, we decided to, to, to do a customized versions um, for, for Stockholm, but to be honest, there are not that much changes from the, from the Danish version since the Danish is already um, fits really in the Scandinavian way of thinking and doing um, pedagogical processes. So we, you see Annette and Annette and yet even on this picture, and I know that all these three attends even this webinar, we did the first course together. Annette and Annette were doing the course leaders and I had the honor together with Anki on this bill to be co-facilitators. Uh, and you see even Marlene, who is also attending this webinar, was well, one of the first participants. So afterwards, we started our own, continuing with our own journey uh, to have one facilitator course um, in the spring and one in the autumn. Uh, we are continuing all the time adapting it more to the Swedish context with Swedish cases, with Swedish participants, with Swedish uh, patients that we involve and even um, include any more the, the leadership, even if a more leadership seminar and even in, involve the leadership in the last afternoon to, to look on the IPE initiatives that are done. And um, you can really say all participants appreciate this, this course. Um, sustainability, um, yeah, we, we, I think the leadership um, agreement is really crucial. Uh, we, we still have to do m much marketing on different levels in the different clinical settings. And we have even a network for all the facilitators that have attended our courses. And we invite, but it's even copied from the Danish colleagues, I have to be honest, to invite earlier facilitators to give their experience and have some parts in the, in the course. 
Uh, lesson learned, uh, I think it's really, really important to have mixed group of participants from different clinical settings, but also different professions. It's open to all the professions in the health score system, even the professions that are not academic um, educated, assistant nurses, for, for example. Um, so this is really an advantage. And I think the pedagogical arrangement, the mix of methods is really, really um, appreciated and really, really effectful for, for all the participants and um, the continuing work with leadership on, on the different levels. Oh. So it was a short uh, journey to Sweden even. I think there are many questions and many discussions that you would like to highlight. So yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you.